serious, and I'm going to be performing my serious for you tonight. So, hope you enjoy. April 22nd, 1960. Sybil, would you like to meet the others? If, if you want me to, I will introduce you to Marjorie first. Here she is. I'm Marjorie, Marjorie, Dorset. Marjorie, how do you feel? I feel grand, vivacious, like I could accomplish anything. Yes, Marjorie, and why did Sybil leave you behind? She had ideas of her own, and she never did do what I said. I think she wants me now. Okay, Marjorie, you can go now. Sybil, the others are right here. You can choose the next one you would like to meet. That would be, um, Vicky. Vicky. Vicky, this is Sybil. Say hi, I should like to be a friend. Sybil, now tell me, why did you leave Vicky behind? Oh, see, when I couldn't do something, um, Vicky did it for me. Under hypnosis, Dr. Wilbur begins the process of the interrogation of Sybil cells. Analysis has revealed that Sybil was born normal, but was subjected to cruel child abuse, which resulted in multiple personalities. In Floretta Schreiber's novel, Sybil, we will look into the classic true story of a woman possessed by 16 different personalities in order to survive. Follow along to her long, ultimately triumphant journey back to wholeness. <laughs> Ever since Sybil could remember, the laughter, wild laughter, accompanied her mother's rituals. <laughs> we don't want anyone looking in, spying on us. She shut the door and closed the window shades. She laid Sybil on the kitchen table. Don't you move. A favorite ritual then was to separate Sybil's legs with a long wooden spoon, then tie her feet to the spoon with dish towel and string her to the end of a light bulb cord. The child was left to swing freely while the mother proceeded to the water faucet to wait for the water to get cold. Well, it's not going to get any colder now, is it? She would then fill the adult-sized enema bag to capacity and return with it. Insert the tip into the child's urethra and fill the bladder with cold water. I did it just like I said I would. These early morning rituals also included unneeded enemas with water with twice as much as would normally be given to a child. Hattie would then have Sybil walk around the room holding the water. This resulted in cramps, but if Sybil cried, Hattie would beat her. I will really give you something to cry about! Now don't you dare tell anybody about this because if you do, I won't have to punish you. God's wrath will do it for me. By the time Sybil was nearly three and a half, she no longer cried. Another ritual Addie executed was by laying Sybil on the kitchen table where she would force into the child an array of objects. A flashlight in a small empty bottle, a little silver box, the handle of a regular dinner knife, a button hook. You may as well get used to this. That's what happens when you grow up. Men will hurt you and push you and you can't do anything about it. Now can you? So, I might as well prepare you. Hattie prepared her so well that Sybil's hymen was severed and she was permanently scarred. Later on, when she was examined by a gynecologist, he stated that Sybil would never bear a child. Unable to endure, Sybil would almost invariably allow one of her other selves to emerge. Willard or Dorset, her father, was eventually asked to meet with the doctor to verify Sybil's declarations. Was it safe, Mr. Dorset, to allow Hattie the sole responsibility for raising your child? Hattie was 
odd. It was more than odd. Mr. Dorset, well, Hattie and Sybil never got along. That's when Sybil was a teenager, but weren't there some certain things that happened when she was a young child? You must know something I don't. Do you remember any injuries? Yes, she had accidents, of course, but I never saw Hattie lay a hand on her. What about these burns on your daughter's hands and her black eyes? Yes. This bead in Sybil's nose. Sybil put the bead in her own nose. The doctor got it out. Is that what your wife told you? I had no reason to question her. And what did your wife tell you about the larynx and the shoulder? What makes you think that Sybil would fracture her own larynx and dislocate her own shoulder? But the town bully did it. But did he? Well, the boy said he didn't know a thing about it. Who was guilty, Mr. Dorset? Not Hattie. Not Hattie? Quit questioning me, doctor! Not Hattie. Yes, Hattie, if what Sybil tells me is true. Mr. Dorset, there are some certain things that Sybil says happened in the early morning. As the doctor recounted Sybil's morning ritualistic tortures, Willard Dorset felt himself inwardly writhing. When she mentioned the button hook, he bowed his head. It was a moment of revelation. That's why Sybil screamed when I tied the button hook on her shoes. He could hear his daughter's screams of anguish at the button hook's evocation of hideous pain. I was so overwhelmed by Hattie. I didn't think. Think now. There are eternal scars and injuries that lend credence to her accounts. He could hear his daughter's screams at the sight of that harmless button hook. He then looked steadily at the doctor, seeing the past whole for the very first time. Doctor, I'm sure that Sybil's recollections are true in every respect, and not only are they true, but they happened. It was a pivotal moment. This was witness corroborating the truth about the atrocities in which Dr. Wilbur said led to the taproot of the multiplicity of personalities. Willard Dorset confessed that by failing to protect his daughter from a perilously destructive mother, he was a partner to the violence routinely practiced on his daughter. The lasting effect was that Sybil knew that no matter how harsh one's environment can become, there's still ways of coping. While well, many would consider Sybil ill, the reality was she was not. She used her multiple personalities to survive. She fell into an inert black and blue heap on the floor, but rising to her feet, Sybil seemed taller than her normal self. And a voice, light, lifting, and cheerful, exclaimed, I am the girl Sybil would like to be. My hair is blonde. My heart is light. I have come to set her free. Your old fears seem to be gone, Sybil. You sound well. Oh, I am, Doctor, I am. I am whole. 